Yeah, the York factory. I was up there. Yeah, what can you tell us about it's the York? It's not there anymore. The York. What about the York Grand history Rapid. and York history? For instance, who's responsible? Well, Who was York? James Warren York, born on 25th of November, 1839. My birthday, by the way. November. Not the 1839 part, but uh, we share a birthday in Exeter, New Hampshire. After the Civil War, he moved up to uh, Grand Rapids and because he was a bandsman in the army and had some training, um, decided to go into open a music store with, of all people, Frank Holton. Used to be, uh, I think it was Holton in New York. This was about 1880, they were in business together, and that there's a reason why those guys later on collaborated um, through the tubas. Um, they were former business partners and good friends. And uh, he started importing things, he did a little music publishing, he did a little composing, and as it grew, you know, he moved to bigger and bigger quarters, and they started, of course, making a cornet, and then a trombone, I suppose. Um, and this was all before the Spanish War. I have no idea that there was a tuba made much before 1900. There are York instruments, but the easy instruments, you know what they are. Uh, the double horn didn't come until much later. But I think the earliest tubas were probably in the first five years of the 20th century, 1900 to 1905. They had a serial number of, I would say, minimum of 2,500, probably a little higher than that. They have a 1907 catalog, and there are three sizes of tubas. I think one E flat, two B flats. No sousaphone. Uh, and then by 1915, they've added, I think, all the, the, the tubas that we're familiar with the small E flat, the big E flat, the great big uh, Model 91. Uh, that I've had so much fun with. Uh, Model 91, that's the one that you convert? That's the big one, yeah. The one that I played in the orchestra. Um, <coughs> the, 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 the York family actually sold out about 1915. They had nothing to do with the business after 1915. I think they all moved to uh, sunny Southern California. The old man died in 1927 in California, which I think was the same year that Khan died in Southern California. They all moved out there since they could get away from the Midwest. Uh, but there was a guy named uh, A.J. Bill Johnson, and the did he, I, did he play in the Sousa band? No, but the, this is lore, and it can't be proven. There were, but I have seen in the city directory three Johnsons, all of whom were Grand Rapids city. Directory. Yeah, were instrument makers, and rumor has it that at least one of those other Johnsons was A.J.'s brother. But I'm suggesting there were three Johnson brothers. And I was told by old Gene Pilchuk, who worked at the York factory as late as World War II or shortly thereafter, that um, A.J., Bill Johnson's brother, was a tuba player who played in the Sousa band. Now in those days, that was a, that's, those are very high professional credentials. And if they had a professional tuba player on the staff at York's, would that explain why maybe York tubas were nice? Well, there was a Herman Johnson. That's the, the guy's name. There was a Herman C. Johnson, former member of the Sousa band, played the bass clarinet. And was there, was there, uh, there So, who was the design genius? Now, Jake, Jake was mm -hmm. old enough that he went to the factory and he met Bill Johnson. And I think Bill Johnson might have been the guy who was responsible for whatever the York tubas were. And let's face it, guys, without Jake, who would ever have heard of the York tuba? They were good. Were they better than Kahn's or Martin's? But why did Philadelphia commission it from New York? They commissioned it? Yeah. Yeah, they commissioned the Just tubas. the tuba or other instruments? Too? Probably other instruments, because Stokey was that way. He was crazy about sound, and he, he liked to fool with the recording process, and they had, like, dummy dials for him to play with. <laughs> he made such a... So he might have thought that he needed a jumbo, supersized tuba for a special effect. Maybe York had a good reputation. I think they did. Uh, so did Kahn in those days. So did Martin, Bisher, you know, Holt. But Jacobs had nothing to do with the no. development. That, I mean, he... No, that horn was a done deal before Jake... Came on the scene. Yeah. 
And I got suspicious uh, when I, well, Jake always said that most sea tubas were nothing but cut down bee floods. And thinking like an American businessman, the last thing you want to do is spend money unnecessarily. And if you can take an existing mandrel or tooling that's very expensive to make for a tuba, and you can see how you can get double use out of that tooling or that mandrel or that worker or that assembly line or whatever, it makes a lot of sense that they took existing what they had on hand to turn it into a sea tube. That was my take on it, and that's why I got involved in what I do thinking that Jake's arm was nothing more than a cut down B flat, and the B flats were easy to get. Um, were there a lot of C tubes made in no. those days? No. Uh, Bob so LeBlanc, why was that then? Bob LeBlanc, who just died, taught tuba at Ohio State University, apparently wrote York a letter and asked them when they were still in Grand Rapids before they went out of business. This would have been in the 1960s, I presume. He asked them how many C tubes did the factory make? And the factory wrote back and said, we made 12, not counting the two big ones for Jake. In the history of the York Band Instrument Company, they made 12 C tubas. So I'm thinking, geez, is it possible to find all 12? I know where six of them are. I found six of them so far. Hmm. If, if some of them were not, if, if some guy has a hot tuba, he doesn't want you to know he has it. Uh, but, you know, can we expect, expect to find all 12 of the factory, if that's the truth, 12. Did other American makers make C tubas? Oh, sure. Yeah. Certainly Khan did. At uh, that, in that era? I don't know that Holton did. Well, no, no, because Holton built the horn for Del Negro. And so Holton had a C tuba going back to the World War I era. Uh, Eli Newberger, who I mentioned earlier, owned a bunch of those. One is at, one is at Yale, I think one's in the museum at Harvard. Uh, I've, I've played one of those instruments. And there's a famous picture of Del Negro playing his Holton C tuba. Uh, did Martin make a C tuba? You told me you thought they did. I think, because both Kahn and Martin at one point, shortly before World War I, had rotary valve tubes, but they didn't make the rotors in Elkhart. They had some connection with companies in Europe. I think Martin was in collusion with Cherveni, and I don't know who made Kahn's rotors. This is the horn that Warren Deck owned or owns. It belonged to Fred Guide. There's a famous picture of Guide with a rotary valve C tuba. Um, and then World War I put an end to any kind of commerce with Europe. So that, there was just that brief period of time when they were both putting rotary valves on sea tubas, Kahn and Martin. I'm sure I don't remember. Who else was in business? Holton? We talked about the King? Del Negro. King? King. Olds? H-N-Y? No. Olds was later, I think. King. They were certainly making a sea tuba by the 1920s. Bill Bell had a, a real close connection with Mr. White, Henderson White. Yeah. And Bell always referred to Mr. White, Mr. Sousa. Su yeah, Sousa, not Sousa. Sousa. Um, he was very respectful of, of the people at King, and I think they took care of him. So what tuba did he play? Well, he started out, he borrowed a Cherveni, I think it was a Cherveni sea tuba, because he got the idea that he had to have a C tuba to play an orchestra, end of that discussion. And he won the, the job with Cincinnati in 1924, and then he, I think he bought that horn from whomever he borrowed it. But then he worked closely with the King Factory in Cleveland, you know, on his way out to play the bands in the summer. Um, but he was playing that King Rotary Valve C tuba by about. Uh, I think that horn came in around 1940, and I think he had a great deal to do with that horn. And there are pictures of him in the 40s with, uh, before he went to the New York Philharmonic playing that horn, not in the NBC symphony, but in other things he had to do at NBC. So the King C tuba, uh, yeah, sort of before World War II, as far as I know. You got interested in cutting uh, tubas because of what, uh, you know, the, the, their seat, 
C tubers are nothing more than cut down B flats. Well, that's what Jake said. How, okay. How many? Uh, <coughs> but I remember uh, you telling me at one point. You know, Charlie and I were studying with you in the early '80s. That's when I came to town, and you just you said you get tired of making the drive from Milwaukee to Grand Rapids, and so you just decided to start messing with things yourself. What, well, yeah, and I paid uh, Gene Pilchuck and another guy a lot of money to cut a York tuba. And Gene, uh, God rest his soul, I shouldn't speak ill of the dead, they didn't return a very nice tuba. And I thought, for that kind of money, I might as well buy some hacksaw blades and, some, you know, I can screw up more as easy as that, and it won't cost me as much. And at least I'm a player. So every step of the way, I can determine what's going on with the instrument. So when I built that first big tuba of mine, I mean, it was literally an inch a day, trial and error testing. And I don't know how many times I went down to Ravinia to look at Jake's tuba. And he was involved in that. He was very interested in, in what I was trying to do. But it was his idea when he said they're nothing but cut down B flats. Um, um, so, you know, the rest is history. A minor, minor chapter in an unimportant history book, but uh, how many? You suppose you ended up? Uh, I wish that I'd kept track of that. I never did. Uh, it depends. There's only a couple of those horns that I want to do. I don't think it can be done with every instrument. I've had good success with the big five-quarter York B flats. I've had a lot of success with the big Holton B flats going into C. Um, and then the uh, the horn that became the G60, which was the the, uh, the smallest of the York B flat tubas, had good success with that. The medium sized York B flat, no. Did you mean G60 or G50? The G50 is the equivalent of the Model 33 York. Okay. It's the smallest of three sizes of York. The middle <coughs> B flat, I wouldn't touch. The big one, the little one. I don't like the big E flat York. I love the little E flat York. So the five York sizes, I'm only interested in three of them. Won't touch the others. Uh, so sometimes m my my thing works. Sometimes it doesn't, and I, I'm no longer interested in running guys' tubas for a few bucks. With and the, my reputation. With the I'm just thinking with the York rotor fifth rotor valve. Was that a big innovation in those days? Those days, meaning 1930? When it was made. About 1930. Probably. I mean, the combination of a rotor and a piston. The horn that the con that Fritz guy, Fritz guy is posing with in that famous picture, I think, has five valves. Very hard to find, even if you look at eBay. I mean, our grandfathers were too cheap to spring for the fourth valve. So I don't think that the fifth valve was very, very, it was probably not even in the catalog because they didn't want to be bothered. If you were important enough and wanted one, they might make, make you one. But I, it's, I think it's very rare to see that. Uh, and even on the German contrabass tubas, how often do you see an old Alex with five valves? C or B flat, never on a B flat. And you see a lot of Alexanders, especially on German eBay, I don't know if you go there, a lot of four-valve f tubas over there. Hmm. They don't even consider they need the fifth valve on the f tube. So, uh, I don't know, but you got to put this in historical perspective, too, sometimes. How old is the horn? What was going on in the music world? What were the economic conditions? If you want to play in the town band in East Jesus, Iowa, you don't need a five-valve C tuba. And you don't want to spend any more money than you have to. So. And if the maker wants to sell a tuba, you're going to get a three valve. Oh. You know, speaking of the fifth, the fifth valve, um, you, you, um, your, your placement of the fifth valve on the, the G50, the G60, and uh, you know, my York and your York is somewhat controversial. Have you ever heard Peter Hirschberg play the tuba? Never. Have you heard me play the tuba? Yes. Okay, that's one possible answer, with all due respect to Peter Hersbrenner. Number two, my idea is to think in terms of regions. I want the valves in one place on the horn. I don't want them spread out all over the place. Um, sometimes tubas don't have good low registers, and by putting bigger valves farther along the tube, you're not going to get a better low register. 
you just got unnecessary plumbing, and if you feel better and, and you think you have can play better lower, then you probably do. You could probably get a special hat and become a better lower. Or, you know, one of my flute teachers just sent away for a pink ivory head joint. Well, if she thinks she sounds different, fine. She had to get matching shoes to go with her head joint. Uh, I'm sitting out there. I can't hear any difference. It's still her. She's. But if she thinks she's sounding different, and she's, why do we change mouthpieces? Why do you have so many tubas? Each one of them, you know. Um, so, well, what are the every arguments? part, every part of I, in, in cutting, I, I try to think what happens in this region: the bell, the bow, the big branches, the little branches, the tuning slide, the valve area. What happens in the the, tu the, the lead pipe area? And I'm, I'm trying to nail all of these down and to put a fifth valve out here and put one up here and a sixth valve and all that stuff is nonsense. Especially when acoustics are not fluid mechanics. I mean, you can't just think of water going through a tube and that's what everybody does. The bigger the tube, the more water you get through. Therefore, you're going to be able to play louder and you'll get the next job because that's what it's all about. Okay. Isn't it? We'll see who wins the next any kind of a job, whatever kind of horn he plays, they're going to go out and buy a bunch of them. Tuba, flute, trumpet, whatever. Yeah. Well, uh, you, you certainly <coughs> became very famous Briefly. for that, Briefly. Uh, for, for cutting those, cutting those tubas. Yeah, well, I just, like I say, uh, I think it's probably, the, the essential question in acoustics hasn't been answered because it's too hard. And people are in a big hurry to make money, and a lot of this stuff is pure, plain, and simple. How can I get a share of the market temporarily as quickly as possible? Um, I'm very definitely worried about the flute people who are now putting the birth zone, a little rock on the end of your head, on your head joint, and then telling you you're going to sound better. I mean, there's just so much. I, uh, there's a man who's not nearly as crazy as he who sounds who's making flutes with square tone holes. Wow, square tone holes. That, now that's, that worries me. Maybe there's something going on with square tone holes. Maybe we should have square valves. Uh, up and down, not the kind of rotate. <laughs> you know, gee, square piston valves. Think about it, guys. Uh, sure, if you want to market, you, you can sell a bunch of them for one year and then discover that it doesn't help. You still can't play. You get the iPhone 5. <laughs> and then the iPhone 6. And so on. And so you see what I'm saying. There, but the essential problems of how do, you, how do you scale the open horn to give you a beautiful sound. What is a beautiful sound, by the way? And will you overblow the octaves, the, the harmonics, so that the, the upper notes are in tune? Um, boy, they don't want to touch that one. And that's very rarely been done, if ever. Can you think of a perfect tuba? Is, is Jake's good horn a perfect tuba? Tuba? Close. Perfect? No. Does it go to the gig and send you the check? I mean... <laughs> Don't put that on the internet either, but we were talking about the new uh, York Brunner, and he wasn't going to buy one, and that's that was his reason. I didn't buy one either. Thanks again. Okay. It's been fun. Got the damn nuts in that shot, didn't you? Well, <laughs> not exactly. <laughs>